Hey there friends, Dave Polite of Scanning Missing Project, copyrighted edition for our video channel. Thanks for being here. Remember, you gotta support us somehow. I mean, being here is huge, you're appreciated, thank you. Watch all the way to the end, turn it on when you're walking away, just listen to me, that, that really, really helps. Thank you so much. And uh, some people had some questions about where do you buy our books. All my books are on our website. That's NA, like North America, NABigfootSearch.com, $24.99. That's it. Don't pay $150 or $100 like you pay on Amazon. Those are resellers trying to rip you off. So, a couple of things. During this last summer, there were several articles about the public visiting national parks. And they pointed out the pure stupidity of some of these people around wild animals. There was most recently a photo of some people right next to elk that were in a river. They were standing in the shallows and these people wanted to get a selfie with them in next to the elk. Many people have died from elk goring them. And elk are animals. They are wild animals. Getting close to them is stupid. Now, one of the most dangerous animals out there in the woods that people, most people have no idea is moose. Uh, Angie had a very close encounter with her and two friends just walking down the trail and being cornered behind a tree by a, an angry moose. They can stomp you, they can kill you, they leap up, they put their paws on you their hooves. It's dangerous. They are very dangerous. So don't think about getting close to one of them either. <clears throat> now obviously mountain lions, bears, but still, <laughs> just recently there was somebody taking a video from inside their car and they stopped next to a grizzly mom and a couple of cubs. And the cubs came over to the window <laughs> and put their paws right up and stuck their head in and it was all on video. You don't understand how crazy this is. That mother standing 10 feet away could lunge and jump right through that window and kill you in a fraction of a second. I, I have said this so many times over the years to people, when you are in the wilderness, let me put it simple. Anytime you're outside the city and you see a wild animal, you treat that with respect and dignity and don't get close to it. That's why wildlife photographers have huge lenses because they don't get close to them either. And if they do, it's with much respect and dignity and usually with a wildlife <coughs> officer or wildlife professional with them. So, save your life, save your dignity, do not mess with animals. Do not get close to them. If you want to get close to wild animals, go to the zoo. There's a solution. But too many people are getting hurt these days. Now, the first of two cases today doesn't doesn't quite fit a 411 case but there's really a, a very good reason to talk about it and you're going to understand it it is a disappearance it is odd <clears throat> but let's talk about the the young man his name was Ian Cox 29 years old Went missing August 20th, 2022, just about a year and a half ago. A year and a few months ago. He grew up, became an Eagle Scout. As I've stated before, I respect Eagle Scouts. It takes a lot of determination to get there. He uh, got a Bachelor's of Finance degree from Washington State University in Bellingham. A location I've talked to you about before where other students have disappeared and found in water 
right next to the university. Kind of misses, it, it matches the sobering coincidence profile. But Ian went there. <clears throat> he has a twin brother named Connor, uh, who lived sometime in Santa Barbara and then moved back to Washington. Ian was the director of benefits for a company called Life Stance Health in Seattle. He had an apartment in Seattle. He had an extreme association with climbing, running the mountains. He loved them. And there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> in fact, I respect that greatly because it offers challenges, safe challenges normally that you won't find in a city. He had a long history of outstanding climbing ability. He climbed Rainier, Baker, Adams, Olympus, Hood, Stewart, St. Helens, Sacagawea, and Chucksaw. Some of those are not easy climbs at all. Uh, <clears throat> Ian lived for the outdoors. He climbed every major volcano in the Cascades which is a huge accomplishment. There's a story that one of his friends told about him. His friend said that he told Ian he was trying to shed some weight. And Ian, being the good friend that he was to everybody, says, hey, why don't you come join me on the trail? We'll shed some weight together. Ian didn't need to lose weight. He was thin in fabulous shape. And the friend said, okay, so they decided to meet this day. And the friend said, oh my gosh, I didn't realize what I got myself into. He said, at the end of the day, we had covered 20 miles on running on a trail up in Washington. He said it was the most excruciating thing ever. But Ian just thought, eh, just another day in the woods. <laughs> now, honestly, covering 20 miles for somebody who's not on the trail, even for covering 20 miles, for me, would uh, exhaust me. And if you don't have the right footwear, it'd kill your feet. But he, he didn't think much about that. And he was more about just enjoying the outdoors. Second story. He got to be really good friends with a buddy going through college. And they later stay, stood up being friends in life. And he described Ian as being a somewhat stoic person. I would say that would be introspective, smart, athletic. I looked at Ian's Facebook page. Nearly every picture on it has something to do with sports. Soccer, backpack, biking, bike racing, climbing, athletics of all type. He was into it. When he was young, he worked as a bellman and a valet. Hard work was nothing that he shied away from. As he got older, he found that his brother really wasn't into, into what he was doing in the outdoors, which was fine because they still had a super close bond. Ian later became a member of a climbing instructional group. He was patient. He had a huge amount of experience, passion for it and he was safety conscious. Search and rescue. Ian was also a huge advocate for search and rescue teams, assisting, teaching, and eventually needing their aid. Another big topic for Ian and Connor when they were growing up is they loved food. They had taken interest in Dick's burgers. This is great. And it's, a, it's in the greater Seattle area. It's a franchise formed in a, it kind of forms a 25 mile circle around the city with all their different restaurants. And they were committed to trying each one. And later in life, Connor and his parents did something about this. And I'm gonna tell you more about that later. But <clears throat> August 20th, 2022, Ian took off on a one day 
excursion. And he had planned it for some time. He was going to he was going to climb a mountain named Mount Dagenhart in North Cascades National Park. If you've never been to North Cascades, way up in northern Washington, right near the Canadian border, pretty isolated, doesn't get a lot of visitations compared to most parks. But Dagenhart was a 9.5 mile hike one way, 19 miles round trip, plus, you know, maneuvering up the mountain. He was alone, but he had planned to meet some other people on the mountain after the climb. He was carrying a sat phone with a PLB built into it, something I have. Uh, sat phones weren't that big and built right into the side of the phone is a button you push, push to activate a personal locator beacon. Now the way the story goes is that it was believed that Ian was on a technical traverse section. Traverse means they're going across the mountain, not up. And he's going across, and technical means you're on rope. So he had a carabiner on his rope, and he's maneuvering. Obviously a dangerous part. But in my mind, I used to rock climb when I was younger, a lot, that it's actually more dangerous in my mind to not be on rope. If you're on rope, then... If you fall, you, you've got some safety. If you're not on rope, you have nothing. But the way the story goes, he was on this technical traverse. He didn't make his schedule meet with his friends. He didn't call anyone on his sat phone, and his PLB wasn't activated. Eventually, those friends called Ian's family, reported him as missing, and that started the search and rescue. Once Connor heard about it, he drove straight to the mountain. And he got involved right away with Search and Rescue, National Park Service, Whatcom County Search and Rescue, etc. They brought in technical climbers, and the Park Service <coughs> stayed, on stayed on site looking, trying to find out where Ian might have went. It was a massive Search and Rescue for about seven, seven days. Unfortunately, they didn't find Ian. Now, his PLB not being activated, that's not really a surprise to me. And why is that? Because if you fall on a climb, it's usually going to be devastating. It's probably going to kill you. Depending where he was, he could fall into a lot of different areas where they're almost impossible to get into and search. Now, I've never been on the side of this mountain, but due to the comprehensive nature of the search and him not being found, you can only guess that they believe he fell into a bad area. Now, the, there was never any notation that they brought dogs on the mountain. There was never any mention of bad weather. No mention of tracks. Not a lot. Obviously, losing a treasured brother, son, as Ian, and him being a twin, I can't even imagine what it did to his family. It tore him apart. But Connor, I like what he did. I like it. On October 22nd, 2022, Connor got some friends of Ian's together who were climbers and they talked about their love of Dick's Burgers. And they truly admired the spirit and the effort that was put forth by Search and Rescue to find Ian. So they wanted to give something back. <clears throat> so they started something called Dick's a thon. D I C K S slash A slash thon. Dick's a thon, a benefit for Washington Search and Rescue. Now, this is what the website says. You can Google, you, you just Google Dick's a thon benefit Washington Search and Rescue and you'll find this. And it says, 
circumnavigation of Seattle via classic drive-in dicks. Making a 26 mile loop while eating their famed menu items. A test of fitness and physical, mental and gastrointestinal. That was the first year they did it. And they just ran their second one the other day on October 21st, 2023. Why do I like it? Because it helps good organization, search and rescue, number one. Number two, it keeps Ian's memory alive. He did a lot for search and rescue. He did a lot for the climbing community. He was a good soul. We were a better place with Ian here. And I hope his brother and his family can hold that memory tight. And think of all the good times. Now, here's a photo of Ian doing what he loved best, climbing. Young man, not that old, only 29. Now, where did this happen? <coughs> well, Mount Dagenhart, about 8,004 feet tall. Now, in the bio I read, you said that he had climbed Shuksan and Baker right here. And this is where he went to school in Bellingham. Now he lived down here in Seattle. So all this area, when he was going to school, he spent a lot of time there. This area is gorgeous. And as far as natural national parks, if you're thinking about going to one, that's one I would go to just because not a lot of people, a lot of great hiking. Keep your eyes and ears open, carry bear spray. Yeah, there's bears there for sure. So that's the Ian Cox story. And while it's not a 411 story, I like it in that his family did something good coming from something horrific. All right, the next story. Now this is a 411 story and you're gonna see right away why. Uh, a boy named David Pike went missing August, I'm sorry, April 21st, 1937 in McMillan, Oklahoma. He was three years old. He went missing at about 5 p.m., 5.30. The home was 15 miles east of Ardmore, Oklahoma, and it was the home of Mr. and Mrs. Hosea Pike and David. This is McMillan. You can see all the water almost circles the city. Here's Marysville Oak, Jimtown, Bernieville, Gordonville, Durant. Kind of get the idea of where you're at in Oklahoma. This is the best picture I could come up with regarding David. I'm sorry, but it's about the best. Again, he went missing about 5, 5.30, April 21st. Mr. and Mrs., or correct that, Mrs. Pike had just laid David down on his bed for a nap. She stated she locked the door to the room. Now, I don't know if that meant locked it from inside, outside, but that's what numerous articles had stated. It also stated something interesting to me. She stated that she was putting him down for a nap because she had lost a cow earlier in the day and wanted to go look for it. Hmm. Well, if you're uh, a regular here, you know that many people have disappeared looking for a cow. I don't know what to make of that, but it's true. And I would call this point of separation, where the mom got separated from her son. So about a short time later, Mrs. Pike checks on David. 
and he was gone. The area around the farm was small hills, small, small bushes, not a lot of big timber, just rolling hills. Well, Mrs. Pike got her husband and they searched the farm, called David's name. Slowly the word got out to neighbors and they were organized into groups as they showed up. At 7 p.m., rain started to fall in and around the Pike farm. How many times has this happened on searches? <clears throat> but this wasn't just like normal rain. This was like a major downpour. So, they still were able to garner about 150 searchers that night on scene with headlamps calling David's name. David was wearing thin clothes. He was put to bed with no shoes on. And after several hours, many of the creeks and the ravines around the Pike Farm were flooding because of heavy rain. Well, as the search went on, the searchers got more and more concerned because they weren't finding David close to the farm. So they kept pushing out and pushing out, and they eventually pushed out to five mile radius. Uh, many of the sheriff's deputies and state patrolmen that have been in that area stated that if there were tracks, they were washed away the first hour by this heavy rain. That's, that's pretty heavy rain. Well, April 22nd, the following morning, 6 a.m. Searchers had been in the area all night, yelling his name, building bonfires, searching up and down the trails around, nothing. 6 a.m., new searchers arrived and the ones that were out all night went home. A man named Arnold Cornelison, who's a local farmer, arrived with a big group of people Everyone was divided up, and Arnold was given a specific area to search. There were a couple predominant trails leaving the house, and Arnold took one of these. Well, he was walking on the path, walked by hundreds of searchers, and he was about 300 yards from the Pike home. He's slowly walking around, keeping his head down, and he comes upon a bush next to the trail and he looks, and he sees a little boy laying in the bush. And the face of the little boy is resting on his left arm, left arm. Arnold said when he first saw David, he thought he was dead. But then he went over and he touched him, and David moved. And then Arnold reached down towards him. <coughs> as David was opening his eyes and he asked him, hey, do you want to go home? He said, yes. Picked the boy up and he carried him home to Mr. and Mrs. Pike. David was found with his shoes on backwards. That was number one. Number two, the Pikes immediately called their family physician, a Dr. Holland. David wasn't chilled. He had no sniffles, yet he was soaked. He was found out in an open area next to a trail, completely wet. At a time when temperatures had plummeted in that area when rain hit at about 7 p.m. last night. The doctor stated that David was in remarkable condition for being there all night. When he got home, David's mom asked him, What happened? 
And he said he had no memory other than crawling into that bush at dark. One of the title of the articles that I researched stated 14 hours in driving rainstorm. So when water hits the body, it takes heat off of the body. When you're in water, like you're in a bathtub or in a pool, and the water temperature is lower than the body temperature, it tends to drain the body of heat. This is how hypothermia sets in. So if you're in water, it drains the body rapidly. If it's raining on you, it's draining the body rapidly. So why didn't David have hypothermia? It didn't make any sense to anybody. Why was this? Because David was wearing a red sweater that was soaking wet and it was getting drenched with rain every minute. So it's just as though David was laying in water. But a better point, he was wearing a red sweater. Why didn't anybody see this? So let's think about the profile points. Weather, heavy rain, right? Water. Searchers stated that David was found right next to a ditch that was filled with water from the rain. Previously searched. The trail that David was on was one that searchers had taken all night and all day when they were looking for him. Where was he? How did he get there? I find it's interesting that he's it was described as being in the bush. Okay. Shoes on backwards. First of all, how did David get out of the room if it was locked? Did David even put his shoes on? Now, there is the likelihood that he, being a little guy, put the shoes on the wrong feet. But that sure must have been painful to walk all that distance with shoes on the wrong feet. Now, no hypothermia. That's really something that bothers me. Because kids don't have the resiliency that adults do. He should have been hypothermic. Absolutely. But he wasn't. Now, let's go back to the original cause of this whole incident. Mrs. Pike lost a cow. Well, none of the articles stated if that cow was ever found. But I do find it peculiar that that's what she was doing when her son disappeared. So now, you, if you've been listening for the last couple months, these little stories should start to resonate with you. And they might even actually be a little boring to you because the same facts keep coming back time after time after time. And I know many of you don't get the importance of historical disappearances. 1937, yeah, that's, that's 90 years ago, a little less. But why is that important? Because some of you think <clears throat> that our government's doing this to us, that it's a special squad who are out there taking and abducting us. Well, if that was the case, then that squad was doing this 100 years ago. How about 300 years ago? Because that's how far back these cases go. I'm sorry. I don't believe that. I don't believe that our government had that ability 100 years ago. Now, they may have that ability today. But if they're doing it today, then something else has to be doing it as well. So I'm not saying you're wrong, but they couldn't have been doing it the entire time that I've documented this happening. So please, please share this on your social media. 
If you like it, give it a thumbs up. Make a comment or two if you like. Right below on the left-hand portion of your screen, it shows our logo. If you click on that logo, that'll get you to about 580 different videos that we've made, including there's a class you can take online, Bigfoot 101, 20 classes long, and there's a final, and there's a gift if you take the final and pass. So pay attention to it. I'm very grateful for each one of you that watch me. Uh, I realize that I have a responsibility and I take it seriously and keep coming with the cases. If you know of one in your area, send it to me. Send it to me at can am missing, like Canadian American, can am missing at yahoo.com. Be nice to your family. Be nice to the people in your community. If you see somebody that needs help, go out of your way to help people. It costs us nothing. We need to be good people in this life. Pull out. <laughs>